when I have left high school, I told my father that I wanted to become a journalist. And um, therefore, I would like to study the Swedish language and uh, the history of literature. And he said that that was a uh, not so smart idea, according to his understanding. Well, anyhow, I decided to try it out, so I started uh, to work as a volunteer at the newspaper and started to write articles. And what I learned in that rather short period uh, was to write short sentences. I had an editor that sat behind me and shortened my sentences very much. And I've always, always remembered his corrections because they told me one important thing. Think before you write. Write and then see if what you wrote is exactly what you thought. And write it as short as you can. Well, after some time, as a journalist, um, I decided that I should follow my father's advice and I applied for dental school and uh, I was accepted and, and uh, I became a dentist. And uh, then um, to start in a private practice was in the beginning uh, very interesting, but after a while I, I, I felt that there was so much more I needed to know about certain things that I came back to the university as a part-time. A clinician, and uh, there were many different fields that I could have been interested in, uh, oral surgery one, and, and then it became perio and restorative dentistry. Uh, but um, if I hadn't become a dentist, I would probably have become a journalist. There were a couple of fundamental papers that I always uh, regarded as important when I was a young periodontist, and they still are, by the way. There was one paper by Dr. Henry Sherp, who at that time was the director of the Dental Institute at NIH in Bethesda. He uh, published a review paper on the epidemiological contributions to our understanding of periodontal disease. And for the first time, he documented that there was a strong relationship between age, oral hygiene, and periodontal tissue deterioration. Uh, a few years before he published this paper in 1964, uh, there had been indices recommended for, for epidemiological studies. The periodontal index, for instance, by Russell, and the oral hygiene index by Green and, and Vermillion. And when these studies now were used as reference for Sherp's paper, it was clear, uh, according to him, that 90% of periodontal disease could be explained by the oral hygiene factor and the age factor working together. We should also remember a very important publication by the Verha group from Oslo, published in 1961, with Dr. Levdal as the senior author. And in this particular research, they had treated about 1,500 Norwegians uh, with oral hygiene instruction and scaling root planing repeated every six months for five years. And they could, in this particular study, document that indeed gingivitis was reduced by 50% or 60%, and so was also tooth mortality. So here we had now two studies, very, very important, showing that the cause of periodontics, periodontitis, in most situations was plaque and calculus, or the oral hygiene factor. And the effect was periodontal disease. Um, at that time, we should also remember that, that there were many, 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 many studies in the 60s from the Müllermann group, uh, with Hubert Schroeder as the main uh, author, that investigated all aspects of calculus, subgingival calculus, supragingival calculus, its content or mineral, etc., because they believed that calculus was the cause 
of the inflammation in the gums. Uh, but then came uh, Harold Lerr with his experimental gingivitis in man, 1965. That clearly showed that when bacteria were allowed to accumulate on tooth surfaces and proliferate on tooth surfaces, gingivitis developed. And when subsequently the deposits of bacteria were removed, the gingival lesion was resolved. And then, as we may remember, uh, chlorhexidine was reintroduced in the middle of the 60s. Chlorhexidine uh, was attached to all mucous membranes and was slowly released. So it established an antibacterial milieu in the oral cavity for many hours. And when the students in Aarhus, in Dr. Leu's uh, hometown, rinsed with chlorhexidine twice a day but didn't brush their teeth, no plaque formed and no gingivitis formed. So this was uh, the, the, the starting point for my experience in Perio that the main enemy was bacteria on the tooth surface but also that in order to grow subgingually, in chronic periodontitis at least, we needed calculus formation to retain the bacteria in a subgingual location. Once it had been established that, that uh, plaque formation will cause gingivitis, then of course the next question was uh, how long will it take in order to uh, periodontitis to develop from gingivitis. Uh, and in order to get some answer to that, we initiated a study uh, in the uh, early 70s where we had two groups of dogs, beagle dogs. Uh, one group of dogs were allowed to accumulate as much plaque and calculus as they wanted. And uh, the other group of dogs had their teeth cleaned every day uh, at least six days a week. They were free on Sundays. And then we monitored the dogs on a monthly basis and found that after about uh, two to three years, uh, gingivitis in some parts of the dentition had developed into lesions that included bone loss, let's say. Uh, uh, and that after four or five years that uh, the bone levels were in some dogs uh, quite advanced. But we should also know that 20% of these gingivitis dogs never developed periodontitis. So there was a, f yes, there was a factor showing that in most situations uh, plaque leads to gingivitis which is long-standing leads to periodontitis. But there was also situations of course when this did not happen. And that left, led us to uh, susceptibility of sites and patients with, with periodontitis. Uh, well, you should also remember here that, that, that susceptibility in these days, in the early 70s, was something that we didn't understand. Uh, we, we, uh, we, had a, we had patients with extremely advanced periodontitis uh, that no one else wanted to treat and they had uh, one third of the roots left, Expec except a few teeth, like the canines, for instance, uh, in the upper and the lower jaw, like the uh, first and second premolar in the lower jaw, which very often in, in severely destructive detention, dentition had quite a lot of bone left. So uh, Dr. Stuart Neiman and I said, why don't we plan our reconstructions around these teeth that despite the patient must be tremendously susceptible to periodontitis, still are standing out as a monument of a glorious past to make the bridge reconstructions. And so we did. And you may also recall that at times we didn't have so many abutments in our reconstructions, but uh, to many people's surprise, these reconstructions uh, left the patient uh, only when they died in most situations. So this is what we knew about susceptibility in these days and, and, and later on we have of course started to understand that there were risk factors like smoking and diabetes uh, 
but in those days in the coffee rooms in the department all people smoked so we didn't consider smoking to be a significant factor diabetes uh, yes and and uh, uh, we also realized that in certain families uh, most people had periodontitis where in other families there were uh, no periodontitis to be found so yes of course we understood susceptibility but we couldn't really put our fingers on it in my training at the University of Lund uh, the only surgical treatment that we performed was gingivectomy in the 1960s with a wonder pack placed over the, the wound etc etc and that worked pretty well uh, subgingival scaling and root planing, uh, yes, but that was mostly an entertainment for students. Uh, our professor told us that you can do scaling and root planing to a certain level, but then you have to do a surgical access therapy in order to get access to the root surface. And then I remember in the early 1970s, when this department here in Gothenburg had been established, we were invited to a meeting in outside Oslo, in Norway, where we discussed different forms of treatment of periodontal disease, surgical and non-surgical, and uh, different surgical approaches, gingivectomy, modified Widman flap, resective surgery, non-resective surgery, etc. And it became quite apparent for us youngsters that uh, none of the old boys in the field of periodontology really had done any comparative studies whatsoever between different treatment techniques. Uh, remember Ramfjord in, 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 uh, in Michigan? He came out in the late 60s with a paper documenting that uh, subgingival curatage was a better technique than, than, uh, than the surgical approach. Uh, you can always argue his um, uh, curatage and non-surgical or surgical approach, but he's, he looked upon it as a non-surgical approach. But that was the first time when anyone had compared the outcome of two different treatments of periodontal disease. So we decided on our way home from Oslo in the core that now we should start a series of studies comparing different uh, treatment approaches and study the outcome very carefully. But then we also decided that since we knew that uh, indeed the main cause of gingivitis and periodontitis was plaque and calculus, we said that in order to do this comparison in a correct way, we will recall all patients, all patients, every two weeks for oral hygiene instruction and a new cleanup, professional tooth cleaning in order to prevent recurrence of disease. So we performed also split mouth treatment. So a patient had four different or six different sextants, four different quadrants of six different sextants, in which different treatment techniques were employed. Patients came back for professional tooth cleaning every two weeks for two, three, four years. Uh, and we had a lot of patients, 50 patients in, 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 in the first studies. And Rosling, Bengt Rosling, was the senior author. And everyone in this building said, you're crazy because patients will not come back on a two-week basis to you. The problem was when we finished the studies, because now the patients were so used to coming here, so they felt that we disappointed them by saying, no, thank you, we have uh, completed what we wanted. Uh, with you and you will have to come back on a regular six-month basis recall system. And doing that we, we, we really show that, that the technique used to get access to the root surface was not so very important for the treatment result. The importance was the level of root surface cleaning that we could accomplish. Among periodontists, there was, um, after the publication of the uh, long-term studies from Gothenburg, some reluctance in accepting uh, that, that scaling and root planing could be enough as treatment uh, for many cases of periodontitis. Uh, 
but we also said that that the problem is that we deal only with a single rooted part of the dentition. We are not dealing with focation involved molars with this technique because we realize very quickly that the cleanup of a focation defect, open focation defect in an upper second molar is not being handled by uh, a, a non-surgical uh, treatment approach. But we also said that, that we believe that subgingival scaling and root planning is much more time consuming without elevating a flap or without performing a gingivectomy than after the elevation of flap and, and, the, and, and, and the gingivectomy. So, so we never advocated really scaling and root planning as the measure of treatment of advanced periodontitis. But then again, there were many, many clinicians, especially on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, who didn't like the idea that their favorite technique of treating patients was not superior to other techniques. And uh, that we were blamed for for many, many years, but uh, uh, we still stick to the uh, data that we accumulated in the 70s, and they show clearly that the technique as such uh, is not important, but it is the cleaning of the root surface that is important. We also have to consider residual pockets. If there are anything that I'm convinced of, that is that if we leave deep pockets behind, we will get recurrence of disease. And that was clearly demonstrated by Dr. Kaldal and his group in Nebraska uh, in the 70s and early 80s. They reported that the deeper the residual pocket was, the greater was the chance of, of further advanced attachment loss. You have to interpret these residual pockets in an intelligent way. Because if you do, let's say, an apical reposition flap, then a gingival tissue will reform and a pocket form. You know, the old, the old idea of zero pockets, that, that is an unphysiological approach, which is not true. But if you do a, a gingivectomy or an apical reposition flap, there will be a new gingival unit formed to protect the periodontium. Now, if you do scaling and root planing, the inflammation will go away and the tissue will shrink. So it means that between the upgrowth and the shrinkage, there will be very little difference. And I still insist that if you do a surgical therapy and you have a pocket of five or six millimeters, it's a failure. In the beginning, we believed that our surgical treatment of uh, periodontal disease resulted in uh, tissue regeneration. Um, uh, we believed that in order to get tissue regeneration, we needed to have a surgical approach so we could remove mechanically the granulation tissue in the angular bone defect. And what we saw then, following our treatment, was that this angular bony defect gradually filled out with new bone, and that we got this corticalization of the ridge. You saw in the radiograph the white line that we always love to see, which to us indicated that there was no inflammation left. So we said, great, with surgical therapy we get this regeneration of the periodontal tissues. And we didn't need to, as they did in America, often add hydroxyapatite or tricalcium phosphate or whatever. Uh, and we were happy with these results. And we often talked about our regenerative approach until Caton and Zander in a monkey model, and I think that was in 1976 sometime, reported that if they treated an angular bone defect with a flap 
approach, scaling route planning and a flap approach, they could obtain quite marvelous bone fill, which they could see chronologically. But when they took a biopsy from the regenerated sites, they found that there was a long junctional epithelium all the way down to the notch in the root surface where, from which they had performed scaling and root planning. So this was the first evidence documenting that indeed you could have a long jun junctional epithelium separating the uh, root surface from the bone in a previous angular bone defect. But that also meant that all our data concerning uh, clinical assessment of, of reattachment had to go down the drain. That came as a disappointment. But then we had uh, the luck of inviting uh, Professor Torkil Karring from Aarhus to come to Gothenburg for a three or four year period to um, give us more information about uh, cells and what cells can do. And uh, he had, when he came to Gothenburg, published a number of very, very important studies on uh, the specificity of, of cells and, and tissues. Um, and he said that only cells that originate from the periodontal ligament have the capability of producing cementum and a periodontal ligament. Karing did something else also. He said, now, when you have elevated a flap, you have made your incision, pocket incision, you have elevated a flap, and you have scaled and root plane the surface and removed plaque and calculus. Where is the wound? And in those days, we said the root surface. No, he said, the wound is where it bleeds. And the uh, soft tissue surface, the cut soft tissue surface, was the wound surface. And then Karin said, when you now put the wound surface to the root surface, they coincide, in other words. And what will the epithelium do? Well, it will pro pro proliferate along the wound surface. And that's the reason why you never get new attachment. So instead he said, let's protect the root surface from the wound surface. So he placed uh, a membrane around the, the root. And then he placed the flap on top of the membrane. So the epithelial cells could proliferate on the wound surface which was now outside the root, which allowed a coagulum to form between the membrane and the root, and the cells from the periodontal ligament and the bone to proliferate into this area and establish a new cementum and a new periodontal ligament. So this was what is called guided tissue regeneration, or GTR. Conceptually, it worked very well. But uh, practically, it was not so easy because uh, the first membranes that were used were of uh, the Teflon type from Gore, uh, were not easy to handle. They often uh, uh, disrupted or ruptured the, the, the flap, and you got contamination. And, uh, and uh, on the average, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 millimeter gain of attachment more than in a control situation. When it comes to adjunct in periodontal therapy, uh, we have tried well, at least antibiotics, uh, delivered locally and delivered systemically. And uh, what we have understood from our long-term studies, and, and uh, we have been dealing with, with, with the effect of, of uh, antibiotics during the treatment of active periodontal disease and monitor the patients for eight, nine years. What we have seen is that, indeed, uh, in the first year or so, the uh, adjunctive use of systemic antibiotics, may it be tetracycline or may it be amoxicillin and metronidazole, has an effect on, on uh, uh, both probing pocket depth reduction and uh, clinical attachment gain. But after uh, four or five years, this benefit is lost.
And since it's more important to uh, study treatment outcomes uh, five years down the road than one year down the road, uh, we believe that, yes, initially antibiotics are important, but in the long term, maybe not so important. The belief is that all cases that do not respond to treatment are refractory cases. But uh, we normally say among ourselves in this department that if you have a refractory case, send her to me and I will check how refractory she is or he is. Uh, but obviously, there can be patients uh, who are awfully difficult to treat and to get a good treatment outcome. Whether we should call them refractory or, or not, I don't know. But it's, it's so easy for a periodontist who has failed with the patient to say, this is a refractory case. And that's one of the reasons that we don't like the, the term very much. When it comes to implants, I think it is important that we say the time before Bronemark and the time after Bronemark, because there is a critical time point uh, which we should honor Bronemark for. Before Bronemark, it was mostly subperiosteal implants, which uh, I was taught by my boss in Malmö. They didn't work very well. But I have to admit that, that uh, Bronemark was very consistent uh, in his approach with implants and he changed dentistry. And uh, he, what he did was that he uh, developed a methodology uh, which could be used to restore patients uh, with fixed bridge works, which normally, uh, or who normally would have been treated with partial dentures or full dentures. Uh, so, so he has, in many ways, changed dentistry, but he has also, um, uh, or, or he, the interpretation of Bronemark's findings uh, have also been to, to um, remove teeth that we believe at times could be saved because the maintenance of teeth is a much more complicated procedure than to remove them and place an implant. And, and in, in those situations, I, I think that, that uh, the Bronema concept changed periodontology uh, so that we are no longer as good as we used to were in maintaining or saving teeth. Some of my best friends in the field uh, are, are from America. So I have uh, great admiration both for uh, perio in the United States and for periodontists in the United States. Uh, my main role though in the United States was not the role of a periodontist because I came to the University of Pennsylvania in 1983 as dean of the school. And uh, as dean, you have to be uh, a match in for alle. Uh, you have to pay attention to uh, not only the periodontist, but to all other disciplines uh, within the institution. Uh, but I uh, took part in uh, the perio training. Uh, I met uh, with the faculty in perio and the graduate students every Monday morning for a literature seminar. And I can tell you that was a very, very exciting time for me these Monday mornings. There was no budget, there was not overhead and maintenance cost, and there was no problems with um, this and that, as you had to deal with as dean. But these were the literature seminars where we talked about research. There was Morten Amsterdam present. There was D. Walter Cohen present, Herman Korn. Jay Siebert, Stuart Neiman, B Jürgen Slotz, Max Liskorten, uh, and, and, and you realize these names and, and you understand that, that um, this was a group of people that you would hardly ever be confronted with and to share views with. So for the students in, in the graduate program in period Penn at that time, it was a golden age, I, I, I must say.
even if uh, American paleontology is strong, I still believe that, that the European Academy or the European Federation of Paleontology is even stronger because I believe that our research base in Scandinavia and in Europe as a whole is, uh, is, is very large. Uh, in Europe we have done the very, very critical experiments and the very, very critical studies, and uh, we still do. I also think that if you take uh, most of the innovations in, in Peru, not all, but most, uh, they sort of come from Europe. And even if some of them have been developed in other parts of the world, they have been tested very carefully in Europe. I have met many, many people uh, over the years that I have been chairman in Perio in different parts of the world. Um, and my, my, my first memory and the greatest memory uh, from, as a young periodontist is my meeting with Jens Verhag from Oslo. Uh, Verhag um, was a phenomenal person. He was very, very smart. He performed the critical experiments in periodontology, and he was also a very kind person who helped young individuals to get started. Another person who is not so well known, but who for me was of fundamental importance was Hilding Björn, the person who I told you was chairman of all surgery but started to understand the importance of perio uh, and periotherapy uh, already in the early 60s. When it comes to a textbook of clinical periodontology, uh, you have to realize that, that when the first edition was planned, we all were reading the big American textbooks. And we really didn't understand the basic philosophies in these textbooks. So we wanted to um, publish a book, first of all in the Scandinavian languages, uh, which reflected our views about uh, the basic issues in periodontology. And then, um, after a few years, we decided that the next edition should be in English. And then we invited some, some outsiders, that is, non-Scandinavians, to participate. And now uh, the knowledge base in Peru had grown, so the book became a little bit bigger. And then, implant dentistry, was introduced. And oral surgeons were the main authors and main researchers in implant dentistry in the beginning. Uh, so we decided that, that since now periodontists are using implants more and more, we also have to include implants together with teeth in uh, the textbook. And then it became clinical periodontology and implant dentistry. And unfortunately, the book became thicker and thicker. What we know today is that plaque and oral hygiene are fundamental issues in the development of chronic periodontitis. We know that in some patients, occlusion can be a problem, but not the major problem as it used to be. We start also now to learn about um, finer details about uh, uh, susceptibility. Uh, so uh, I believe that we see a much more refined periodontology today than in, in the 1960s. My only worry is that, that uh, implant dentistry will take over and that uh, periodontology will not come back uh, to the same popularity level as it used to have among young people.
And I think that uh, we should be careful not to forget the techniques to use to save teeth which are very much periodontally compromised.